Hello everybody at Church of Praise Johor Bahru. I'm Pastor Clement Wong bringing you greetings from Ipoh, literally, because now I'm sharing with you the Word of God from my home. I just want to encourage you. I know many of you are now confined to your house. You can't go to the church. You can't fellowship. You are not even meeting in cell groups. Everything is being done online, and of course, we thank God for this uh, multimedia thing and the social network. We can still meet, not in person, but online. Of course, this is for our own safety, and uh, I pray that this will quickly uh, go away and that we can lead our normal lives again. And even talking about leading, leading, leaving our normal life. Uh, to be frank with you, when this uh, movement control order is lifted up, and uh, COVID nineteen virus is no longer a serious threat, uh, many of you would have your business affected, uh, your jobs affected, your company may not be doing well, and so uh, maybe in your home you are beginning to feel a bit. Uh, gloomy, a bit discouraged, and you are uncertain as to what is going to happen uh, when you start off to work again. And some of you feel the challenge uh, uh, in life uh, that when your business is down for about a month. You cannot. Uh, there is no income if you are doing business. And of course, even the church. To be frank with you, the church. Uh, I was in discussion with many other pastors uh, on WhatsApp on message. They all of them say their church offering has been affected. So may I encourage you to give faithfully to your church, and you may not be there, but uh, uh, tie faithfully, give your offering faithfully, and then continue to believe and to trust God. Now, I want to talk to you and share with you today on this topic called Faith Opens Your Eye. At this time, many of us, when we look around, and of course, again, I say those of you who are in business and those of you who are doing a job and a company not doing well, you may not be able to see uh, what God wants to do through you and in the church. You may see only just a little bit darkness, gloom, and doom. But I challenge you today: faith will open your eyes to see what God wants you to see. Many people can't see what God wants them to see. They only see with their own naked eye, with their own eye. They can't see with the spiritual eyes. They can't see what God can do and what God is doing in the midst of difficulty. Let me just read a passage of scripture to you, and uh, it is found in Second Kings and Second uh, Kings chapter six. I'll read to you Second Kings chapter six. Just bear with me for a while, and so if you possible, you can also turn to it. Second Kings and chapter six, reading verse eleven to eighteen. Eleven to eighteen says. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by these things, and he called his servants and said to them, "Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel?" And one of his servants said, "None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom." So he said, "Go and see where he is, and I may send and get him." And it was told him, saying, "Surely he is in Dothan." Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, "Alas, my master, what shall we do?" So he answered, "Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them." And Elisha prayed and said, "Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see." 
Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of the horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrian came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness and according to the word of Elisha. Wow, what a great story we read here. We read here in this story that the Syrian king was very upset because many of his plans to go to war uh, against Israel were... Uh, the, the king of Israel already knew his plan beforehand. So he said, is there a spy among us? Is there somebody who is telling uh, the king of Israel... Uh, what our plans are. And then one of the officers says, O oh, king, uh, it is not that we have, they are spy among us. There is a prophet by the name of Elisha. What you say in your bedroom, God tells Elisha. What a wonderful, marvelous thing. The secrets of your enemy is made known to Elisha. And so the Syrian king said, Oh, like that, we must get rid of him. We must fight him. We must kill him. So what did he do? He sent a great army. Will he send a great army to kill one man? Yes, he did. Because maybe he feared this prophet. Maybe a very special guy. So he sent a great army and he surrounded the, the house of of Elisha. Then one that morning, early in the morning, Elisha's servant, all right, he woke up, he went outside his house and he saw the huge great Syrian army was surrounding them. And he panicked. He ran to Elisha and says, Elisha, there is a great army outside. And Elisha says, don't worry. Those who are for us are more than those who are against us. Now the servant will be scratching his head. What do you mean? Those who are for us are more than those who are against us. Come on, something is wrong with my, with my master, Elisha. I count one, two, two, one, one, two, one, two. There are two of us only. There are two of us. How can we fight against this huge Syrian army? And Elisha said, you go and look again. He went out to look and Elisha prayed, God, open his eyes. And when the servant, the young man went out, the Lord opened his eyes and he saw surrounding the Syrian army was a greater and a bigger army of the Lord. And they surrounded the Syrian army. And the Bible says when the Syrian army was about to attack Elisha, they were rushing to attack Elisha. Elisha prayed and the Lord struck the Syrian army. Brothers and sisters, what do you see every day? Pray that God will open your eyes. If you are seeing discouragement, if you are in despair, if you are seeing hopelessness, if you feel that Nothing good is going to come out of this. The eyes of faith will cause you to see what God wants you to see. See, faith causes us to open our eyes. Open your spiritual eyes, church. Don't just look at the trouble. Don't just look at the problem. Look at what God can do. And that faith will come and will rise within you. Because when the servant saw the Syrian army and he saw the army of the Lord, which is much greater and bigger, he was at rest. Finally, he could see. And so, when we talk about seeing the things that God wants us to see and faith opening our eyes, let me just share with you uh, this morning, three things why we cannot see. 
three hindrances why we cannot see. And I pray that God will help us to get rid of these three hindrances of why we cannot see what God wants us to see. Number one, we cannot see because we are caught in the small little problem. We are caught in small little problem. Let's look at Genesis 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse, verses 5 to 17. It's a little bit lengthy. There's a lot of verses to read today. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor, why you read so many Bible verses today? Well, maybe that's because we seldom read the Bible at home. Oops, turn to your neighbor and ask, is he talking about you? Huh. Well, Genesis chapter 13, and let me read to you verse 5. And very quickly, I think I, um, maybe it's good to read through it so that we all can see the whole picture. Genesis 13 and verse 5 says, And Lord also, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possession was so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lord's livestock, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then dwell in the land, and Abraham said to Lord, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. It's not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lord lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, and it was well and watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zor. Then Lord chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lord journeyed east, and they separate from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lord dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abraham, after the Lord had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also shall be numbered. You know, um, Abraham, when God called Abraham out of his, the Earl of the Chaldee, uh, Lot, his nephew, came along with him. Abraham was the one who was called by God. And God told Abraham, he says that... Uh, Come out from the earth of the Chaldee and go to a place which I will show you. And Lord, his uh, nephew, followed along. And the Bible tells us in this juncture, in this special scripture that we read, that the herdsmen, the herd, the sheep, and uh, the livestock of Abraham and the livestock of Lord has grown. That there was not enough uh, on the field for the livestock to graze. And there was a bickering, a strife that happening between the two herdsmen. What did Abraham say? Abraham said to Lord, let us not strive. Let us not fight. Why don't we go our separate way? You go, if you choose the left, I will go to the right. If you choose the right, I will go to the left. He gave Lord the first preference. Lord lifted his eyes, he saw the plain and the fertile land of Jordan. And he went, he says, I choose there. You know, Lord, uh, Abraham was not a man that looks into small little things and bicker over small little problems. Because if I'm Abraham, I would definitely be very upset with Lord because I'm the uncle. Now, the uncle, uh, you know, gave in to the nephew. The nephew was given first preference. I will say to Lord, I say, you terrible fellow. Huh? I am the uncle, you know. I am called by God. And you are only a tag along, you know. 
And now uh, I at least give you a chance to choose where to go uh, and you chose the very best. What kind of nephew are you? Huh? You are selfish, idiotic brat. You know, sometimes we get caught in these small little things. But Abraham did not complain. He gave in. You know, I remember uh, when we were young. Remember when you were young as a child at the time, you know, when you used to fight with your brother or sister over some toys? What would your mother say? Your mother will always tell you, give in to your little brother. He is younger than you. Let him play first. But somehow as we grow older, those, that policy change that we expect the younger one to give in to the older one. But Abraham says, all right, if you go there, I will choose the other direction. The Bible says, as soon as Lot left, Abraham. God told Abraham to lift up his eyes and he says, as far as your leg and your feet will take you, wherever you go, that land will be yours. As long as you're caught in the little bickering, a little problem, the little argument with your brother or with your sister or with your spouse or with your relative, as long as you're looking at this small little problem that causes you to be upset and discouraged and down and even to hold harbor unforgiveness, God cannot open your eyes. You cannot see the bigger picture because all you see is problems, 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 problems. And you're always looking at the ground. You know there's a difference between the chicken and the eagle. The eagle, if you are an eagle, you know the eagle set his nest on the mountain and he set his, net on the, his, his nest on the mountain and the eagle when he wants to pray, he lift his eyes and he see and he looked at the wind. And when the breeze and the wind comes, what the eagle does is he take a leap. Once he take a leap, he flaps his wing a few times and he take, allow the wind to take him. You can see the eagle flying like this, very little work, but he fly along the wind and he is above the trouble, above the earth, above the problems of mankind. When he look from up, he look at the prey. Are you an eagle Christian? Or are you a chicken Christian? Have you seen chicken Christian? Chicken are always looking on the floor. Boop, 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 boop. Always looking on the floor, searching for food. Boop, 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 boop. And then when something chase them, a dog come and chase them, and they will flag their wing. A lot of energy, some feathers flying away, and they manage only to take one step. That's all the chicken does. A lot of energy. But they are the ones that are caught into everyday struggle and strife with people, problems here, problem there. So let me just ask you, are you a eagle Christian or are you a chicken Christian? I pray that you will be like an eagle that will soar up in the sky and take control. Amen. And secondly, secondly, why we cannot see with our eyes? Why God cannot open our eyes? Because we have negative thoughts. I'd like to read to you from uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 26 to 33. Numbers 13, 26 to 33. All right. In Numbers 13, verse 26. Now they departed and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel 
in the wilderness of Haran at Kadesh, they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Malachites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanite dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as far is a land that devour its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Therefore we saw the giants, and the descendants of Anna came from the giants, and we were like grasshopper in our own sight, so we were in their sight. The second reason why God cannot open our eyes is because we have negative thoughts. Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan. 12 spies. They all see the same thing. They saw the same thing. They all experienced the same experience. They saw the land, they saw the fruits, they saw the people. Why is it that 10, 12 of them when they came back with two different opinions? There were 10 of them who said, we cannot. The giants were too big. The fruits were there. It's a land that really flowed with milk and honey. But we cannot overcome and take the land because of the giants. They are strong, they are powerful. But the other two, Joshua, jo, Joshua and Caleb says, we are well able to take the land. Because if God has given us the land, God will give us the power and the authority to overcome. Two different groups of people see the same thing with two opposite opinions. Is there anything wrong with the thing they saw? No, it's how you interpret. If you are negative, I can bring you a cup of water that is half. A, a pessimist will say, this cup of water is half empty. An optimist will say, this half cup of water is half full. How do you see things in life, brothers and sisters? Are you always negative? Very negative. Always say, cannot, cannot, this cannot be done, that cannot be done, this cannot be done, that cannot be done. Don't give excuses on how what, one thing, what cannot be done. But always think how one thing can be done. Even in your work, even in your business, if you're given a challenge, don't always think how it cannot be done. I've met people who are so negative that the moment they leave the room, it's as though the room is littered up. It's always say, cannot, cannot, it cannot be done, the enemies is too great, the tough is, the job is too great, there's too much things to do. But a person who is positive always say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I can overcome. I can do it because God has enabled me to do it. So brothers and sisters, do not have a negative mind. If you have negative thinking, you must change it. You must be positive. The third reason why we cannot see is because of past experiences. Past experience. Let's look at John 21. I look at John 21. John 21 verse verse the 15 to 18. John 21 verse 15. 
He says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. And in verse 18, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you gird yourself and walk where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Thus, this he spoke, signifying what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. This is really a very interesting story. We all know that Peter denied the Lord three times when Jesus was brought to be crucified. He denied the Lord even before a small girl, a young girl, a servant girl, saw Peter and says, you are one of them. Peter was fearful for his life. Why did he deny the Lord three times? He was fearful. He was afraid that he will also be crucified or he will be killed. Because of this fear in him, he denied the Lord three times. And after he denied the Lord three times, there was a, a, a cockroach who crowed. <coughs> after he heard that, he remembered what Jesus said. Before the cock crow, you will deny me three times. He ran away. He was disappointed. But now Jesus rose from the dead. He's alive. What goes on in Peter's mind? I don't know about you. But if I'm Peter, I will be thinking, oh, I've denied the Lord three times. I failed him. I had been with him. I had lived with him. For three years, I've seen the miracle that Jesus did. And I myself has done some miracles. How can I fail God? How could I do such a thing to God? How could I deny the Lord three times? Will God ever use me? Will God use me again? There are a lot of people today, because of past failures, they are disappointed with themselves. And they feel that God will never forgive them. God will never cause them to rise up. But you know what Jesus said to Peter at the end of the ministry? He Asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Three times to counter the three times he denied the Lord. Three times he affirmed Jesus, I love you. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, do you love me more than this? What is the this that he's talking about? Some people think that, oh, it's the things of the world. But I feel it's because of his fear for his life. So Jesus asked, do you love me more than even your own life? Peter said, yes, I love you. And at the end of the last two verses, Jesus said to him, when you are young, you can go wherever you, you want to go. But when you are older, people will carry you. And I believe, if you look at the verse 19 also, Jesus was actually talking about how he's going to die and his death will bring glory and honor to Jesus. It has been said, we don't have record in scripture, but in history, it has been said that Peter was crucified. And when he, they want to crucify him, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. Please crucify me upside down. Peter was willing to be crucified upside down and lay his life for Jesus. This is to overcome the fear that he had. When he denied the Lord, he was fearful for his life. 
But when Jesus forgives him and says, get over the past, move on. I've forgiven you. I love you. I will empower you. Now Peter was able to even die for Jesus. <clears throat> How about you? Is it because of your past experience that stop you from looking, from your eyes being open? Faith opens your eyes. Once again, if you trust Him, and if you trust in the cross, in the mercy of God, in the fact that God forgives us, and He cleanses us, and He wants to use us again, He can use you again. Don't allow past failures, past experiences to stop you from being what God wants you to be, to stop you from seeing possibilities. So brothers and sisters, trust in God. Have faith in Him. And let me conclude with this. For God to open your eyes, remember, you must, first of all, do not get involved in small little things. Look at the bigger picture. See further than what you're experiencing now. Secondly, do not harbor negative thoughts. Be positive in all your outlook. And thirdly, please don't allow your past experience, especially those that have been unpleasant, even if you have failed God, Jesus forgave Peter. You can overcome it too. God bless you and you have a wonderful time with your family at home. See you.